Ooh, God bless America. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. I said, God bless America. Welcome to the launch of the Beverly and Adrian Afonso Speaker Series here at Caldwell University. My name is Beverly Shunk Afonso, class of 1965, Caldwell College for Women. Yep. Yeah. Women only in those yeah. days. <laughs> My classmates and I got a great education here in Cornwall from the Sisters of St. Dominic. The Dominicans taught us how to think critically, how to reach for excellence, how to seek the truth. I majored in biology, and when I graduated, I got a job in the labs at Shearing Corporation in Bloomfield. While there, I met my husband, Adrian. He was a chemist working in drug discovery. He, from, from his homeland in Goa, India, he came to America legally in 1957. He was a graduate student with a few uh, dollars in his pocket and a passion for chemistry. The University of Wisconsin was his sponsor, and he had a job waiting for him in the research labs at their Madison campus. Adrian taught me to love America. He loved America. I was born in the USA. I was raised in, Bo and, uh, uh, raised in Boonton. And as a citizen, you kind of take it for granted of all the freedoms that we have here in America. Adrian used to tell me freedoms are not an entitlement. They have to be earned. He used to tell me a lot, Bev, only in America, if you work hard, pay your taxes, obey the law, your dreams can come true with the talents that you have. Adrian and his colleagues developed many life-altering drugs, common ones like Claritin and Corsidin, the anti-cholesterol drug Zetia, which collects and eliminates um, cholesterol in your, in your gut instead of the blood, like statins do. They also invented and discovered HIV drugs and antibiotics. Adrian loved to debate. He loved to keep the conversation going by taking the opposite tact of whatever you were feeling. Then, when, frust when frustration reached critical mass, he would kindly look over at you and gently say, you know what? I believe in half of what you're saying. <laughs> this speaker series has been percolating within me for a couple of years now. My hope today is that you will broaden your horizons, converse with one another, debate one another with respect for each other and with the truth. I am also very, very grateful to all the folks who worked in the background to make this day a reality. I am especially grateful to Jeff Sinise, Dr. Sinise, who was with me from the get-go for his unwavering support from this when I presented it to him as a possible um, endeavor about a year ago on my deck on a hot summer day. <laughs> to Beth, Gora, to Phil Keefe, Joe Quinlan, who worked so hard to organize this event, I'm very, very thankful. To Albert and his crew who set up this beautiful auditorium today, they put a lot of work into this. To Jeff, the chief of police on campus, to the Caldwell police, to the New Jersey State Police, to Homeland Security, and yes, to Mr. Ramaswamy's security. This has been a huge endeavor, ladies and gentlemen. To make this come true, I am, all th I am very, very thankful to them. But most of all, I am thankful to you in the audience who took the time today out of your busy days to be here to seek the truth and to make this a happening. And now, it is my extreme honor to bring Mr. Vivek Ramaswamy to the stage. Thank you.
sounds like a wonderful man, but as I was hearing you describe his story, it was one that was familiar to me. It reminded me of the journey of my own parents who came to this country 40 years ago with no money. In a single generation, they came to Cincinnati, Ohio is where I grew up, In a single generation I've now gone on to found multiple successful companies, married my own wife, Apoorva, who herself has lived the American dream as the kid of immigrants who came legally. She's a throat surgeon at Ohio State. Now where we raise our two sons, teaching them to appreciate and love that American dream themselves. And so that speaks to me. And particularly his story even as a chemist, somebody who was an innovator, somebody who was a pioneer, reminds me of actually even this great tradition we've had in our country for years, of the likes of great scientists who have sought to do their work in the United States of America because they could pursue truth without anybody standing in their way. First example of that was actually Joseph Priestley, who came here Shortly after the, uh, around the time of the American founding, he was welcomed by Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin because he had certain beliefs that fell outside of the mainstream Anglican thought. And he couldn't safely pursue his own beliefs in England, actually, he was under threat. He came to the United States as a chemist. I, I didn't plan to talk about this, but I heard you talking about Adrian and his background as a chemist. He actually continues a great tradition that goes back to the founding of this country all the way to the moment where Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson welcomed Joseph Priestley to the state of Pennsylvania. To tell you that American dream, it is, I would love to tell you it's alive and well today. I was talking to a few students beforehand, but it's really not. It is alive and hanging on for life support. And that's what I want to talk about today is what is that American dream? My parents, after they came here, they raised us with not much in Cincinnati, Ohio. And last year I went on to become just 37 short years later, the youngest person in US history to run for president as a Republican. And I would say that I've achieved many great things that I'm proud of in my life, but the one I'm most proud of is that by the end of the campaign, most people in the country were actually able to pronounce my name correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, as you did, Beverly, thank you for saying correctly, it's Vivek like cake and Ramaswamy like Ramaswamy. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> There's only one way to say that one. But I, I got a question that I don't often get the chance to answer, which is, what does your name mean? Or what is the root of your name? So Vivek is derived from a Sanskrit word that actually stands, it doesn't translate directly. If you translate it, it literally it means the ability to discriminate or to discern. But it really stands for wisdom. That would be the Sanskrit word for Vivek. Is, Vivek is the Sanskrit word for wisdom. And it actually spoke to me, being here, understanding the motto of this university as well, sapientia is scientia, knowledge and wisdom. And that's what we're here to talk about today. It was a special occasion for me to come here to talk about the subject of the pursuit of truth and what's the backbone of how we actually do it. The American way is that we do it through free speech and open debate without any idea or any other any other censorship, stopping what ideas we can express. That's what made this country great the first time around. You'll hear a lot these days about the threats to our democracy. And I, I ponder this from time to time. What is the real strength of our democracy? Is it the number of green pieces of paper in our bank account? Is it the number of ballots we cast every November? These things are important, but if you ask me the best measure of the health of our democracy, it's the percentage of people who feel free to say what they actually think in public. And right now, there's no doubt that we're doing poorly on that metric. There's a culture of fear that has spread across this country like an epidemic, fear of losing your job, fear of your kids getting a bad grade in school, fear of becoming an outcast in your own community. And that culture of fear has really replaced our culture of free speech and open debate in America. And I think the way we're gonna get this country back is by all of us starting to actually speak our minds in the open again. Say in public what you will say in private at the dinner table. Say it with a spine. Say it with conviction and say it with respect. But part of respect is that you respect your neighbor and your friend enough to tell them what you actually think. Not some fake, whitewashed, or woke-washed version of it, but the actual belief that you have in your heart. And as long as your friend gets to do the same in return, 
That's what made America great the first time around. Beverly, I hope you don't mind me sharing, but even you were discussing beforehand, you're sitting next to your daughter and, and other family members of yours, how you have diverse views in your own family. Great, I do too, most of us do in this country. And I think part of what we've lost in America is the ability to see, even as we may disagree deeply with an ideology, to recognize that our enemy is not our fellow citizen. Our enemy may be an ideology that we're up against. But the way we're going to get our country back is all of us being able to disagree wildly, but still get together at the dinner table at the end of it. And that's the core premise behind the book that I published this year. It's called Truths, the Future of America First. What is that future? I reflected on my favorite moments from the presidential campaign. And there were some moments that were very contentious. I had one particular exchange with Don Lemon. I remember this. It was at the start of the campaign. He was an anchor at CNN, for those who may have understandably forgotten you know, who he was. But he was a, uh, you know, he was, he was, uh, he, they invited me to, to on the show, presumably to hear my opinions, but as I started to share some aspects of U.S. history that made him uncomfortable relating to what happened after the Reconstruction era, the claim I made was that black Americans only gained their actual autonomy and civil rights after they won their Second Amendment rights. And I think that's a proven fact of history. But he really took issue with this. and effectively told me that I couldn't disagree with him until my shade of melon was the same as his, when your skin is as black as mine. The irony is actually, I looked at the video afterwards and our shades of melon are actually like striking and similar. <laughs> but I take the spirit of his point to be whatever it was, details to one side. And you know, I told him I, I, that America's not a country that dictates what you can say based on the color of your skin, the content of your character is what matters. And you know what, CNN had a choice to make, they had new leadership at the time, was this going to be a network that was pushing one-sided political ideologies, or was it a network that actually wanted to platform multiple different points of view? And so the CEO made the decision that Don Lemon's behavior apparently didn't necessarily, in that interview or others, comport with the values of the network. I can only presume that was behind their decision to eventually fire him about a week later after I had gone on, only to later then discover that that CEO got fired after <laughs> making that decision. But I had those kinds of moments during the campaign that were really contentious, that involved high stakes controversy with the media, with those on the left who may have disagreed with me. But those weren't my favorite moments in the campaign, actually. My favorite moments were actually in settings like these, where we often had <clears throat> protesters that walked into the event. And in one case, I remember I was in Ottumwa, Iowa. There was a woman who came in, it was like the equivalent of the back of that room. She was screaming from the back. Initially, I thought it was a fan. She was screaming so loudly, I thought it was a a boisterous fan, but then I quickly realized that she did not agree with what I had to say. In this case, she didn't agree with my pro-life views. And, you know, I'm pro-life as a product of my faith. I'm Hindu, but I was educated at St. X High School in Cincinnati, which affirmed my faith-based reason for being pro-life. She disagreed with me. But she came into the room and she was screaming. It was like the, the police, the equivalent of our security event, security here was ready to take her out. They were escorting her out. And there was something about it that felt wrong to me. They say there was somebody here who came to be heard. She wanted to share something. You couldn't quite hear because she didn't have the microphone, but she was, she was really screaming at the top of her lungs from the back. She was about to go out the back of the room and I told the security, bring her back. We're actually gonna hear what this woman has to say. And she shared her story, which was actually one where she opted for life, not for abortion. And she was a single mother of a daughter who she had some trouble raising, making ends meet economically. She shared her story, and at the end of it, I shared with her that regardless of our political beliefs or disagreements, she was actually doing perhaps one of the most important things that we could be doing in our country right now, which is bringing up children in our country that is lacking in our fertility rate, that's lacking in parents who are giving love to their children, especially as a single parent. And, and she actually, she broke down. She was in tears at the end of it, and the audience applauded her for her story and welcomed her even though the majority of the people in that room, like me, were pro-life and may have disagreed with her, her pro-choice perspective. It turned out that became a pattern over the course of the campaign. We had a number of people who disagreed with my views on the transgender debates. I shared a perspective that gained some controversy over the course of last year, which is that if a kid says their gender doesn't match their biological sex, it was and remains my view that that is usually evidence of a mental health condition. But the right answer in that situation isn't to affirm that kid's confusion. It is, it's not compassion, that's cruelty. 
Well, we had a number of people who really took issue with that view and interrupted a number of my events. But the way it was reported by the press is Vivek is against LGBTQ rights, whatever that means. There's a woman who was at a bar in Iowa. It's the way you run a presidential campaign, actually, is about a few thousand people in Iowa get to decide you know, who ends up being the, the eventual presidential nominee. And it's actually a beautiful system. There's a lot to like about it because it allows for these intimate interactions. But there was an event, there was an event at this bar in Southwest Iowa, I remember it vividly, where there was mostly a friendly audience, but she was kind of a heckler in the back. She had short cut hair and, uh, and she was wearing jeans and she would kind of heckle me over the course of the speech. And I said, okay, I'm gonna open this up to q and I'm gonna finish the speech, but after I speak, you get to speak and we're gonna hear you as long as you're respectful to everybody else and hear what they have to say. She said, fine. So I gave her the microphone and, and she shared with me, she, she said, I'm a lesbian, you're against my way of life, your words are an affront to me, I've served this country in the military, and I disagree with where you stand on the view of LGBTQ rights. And I began to explain to her, look, I draw a distinction between adults and kids. Kids aren't the same as adults, do you agree with me? She said, yes, kids aren't the same as adults. Well, I share with her my view that as a fully grown adult, you're free to identify how you want, name yourself how you want. As long as you're not hurting somebody else, it's your decision as a fully grown adult to make a decision about how you want to identify yourself. But kids aren't the same as adults. And my only caveat for adults, by the way, is this too, is you can identify how you want, but that doesn't mean that men should be able to compete and win trophies in women's sports competitions. She said, wait, what did you just say? I said, I said that men should not be free to just compete in women's sports competitions because then we wouldn't have women's sports. And she said, well, hold on a second. I actually agree with you on that one. I said, okay, well, we found some common ground here. We ended up getting a drink at the bar afterwards and it turns out that we had common views on the way the US VA is failing to actually take care of our veterans, which turns out to be another situation that she was suffering from herself. And so one of the things I learned from this this extraordinary journey, actually, of running for president. I managed to get 8% of the Iowa caucus, which is more than people expected of me, but wasn't enough to win the presidency. <laughs> as, a, uh, as a first timer, I, I started, people said, you started at 0%. I corrected them and said, I didn't start at 0%. I started at 0.0% to be precise. <laughs> and you know, in the course of 11 months, was able to beat multiple governors and senators in the form of vice president, which I think speaks less about me and more about what's possible in this country. But anyway, it wasn't enough to win the presidency, but to earn that 8% of the Iowa caucus, I probably had tens of thousands of individualized conversations like the two that I just described. Both of those were in Iowa alone. And what I learned is that, first of all, I'll say a few things. One is that we're not nearly as divided as a country as we're taught to believe. Right? This myth of national division, it's almost become part of our self-conception as a nation, that we're deeply divided. I thought that at the time I started my campaign. I can now tell you affirmatively from my own experience, and when I say tens of thousands of individual conversations, I'm not exaggerating that. Tens of thousands of people over the course of a year, it impacts you. And there's one way you could approach that. One would be by having sort of a standard stock answer that you're pulling off a shelf that you bring to each of those individual conversations. But the far more tiresome yet more meaningful way to do it is if you really go through treating each of those individual conversations as a unique interaction, boy, do those tens of thousands of interactions really change you as a person. What I learned through that, and I have deep conviction in today, is that we're not really as divided as the media or the social media algorithmification of our interactions would suggest. I think 80% of us in this country, easily 80 plus percent of us in this country, share the same national values in common. And I would further posit that half the 20% on the other side are people basically younger than me who never learned those ideals in the first place. They're with us too. So what's actually going on is we've created this myth of national division, which I think has some commercial benefits to the people who perpetuate that division, not the least of which is the media marketplace in which we live today. That was the first thing I learned. But the second thing I learned is that there are just some questions. You could pick your Hottest button issues, abortion is on that list. You could probably pick some element of this transgender or LGBTQ culture debate on this list. Probably the climate policy, which I could talk about a little later. There's a few of these issues where I'm convinced that we won't find 100% common ground because they're mutually exclusive choices that need to be made. So how is it possible to find national unity in the face of those divisions? 
one of the things I learned is it's by actually going to the other areas. We're going to agree to disagree here, but still go to the other areas where most of us still end up agreeing. So you and I may disagree on whether we're pro-life or pro-choice, or whether an 18-year-old or a 17-year-old should be able to undergo genital mutilation and chemical castration. But we're going to leave that over there, and we're going to go over here and just ask ourselves, do we agree on a principle like merit? The idea that the best person gets the job regardless of their skin color. That you get ahead in this country, not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions. I think actually most of us tend to agree on that. Do you agree that you get to speak your mind openly and express any opinion, whatever it is, no matter how heinous I may find that opinion, that you have the right to express that opinion as long as I get to in return? I think most of us agree on that. Do we agree, and this one's a big one for the next few years, do we agree that people we elect to run the government whether I agree with them or not, the people we elect to run the government should be the ones who actually run the government, as opposed to unelected bureaucrats who were never elected to that position. I think most people, Democrat or Republican, agree with that basic principle of self-government. I see this as the kid of illegal immigrants. Do we believe in the rule of law? And does that mean that if your first act of entering this country breaks the law, that means that you actually still broke the law and we have to enforce it? I think most of us in this country actually agree on those basic rules of the road. My immigration policy perspective sometimes got controversial on the campaign. I start with a few basic principles. No migration without consent. Consent should only be granted to migrants who benefit America, and those who enter without consent must be removed. I actually think most Americans have just formulated as such. Start talking about mass deportations right off the bat, people might have a different view. But if you go with those basic principles, no migration like your body is a nation and your nation is a body. No migration without consent. Consent should only be granted to migrants who benefit America, and those who enter without consent must be removed. And I will take that as a voice of affirmation right there <laughs> from the next generation. I actually think most of us tend to agree on these basic rules of the road, and that's a beautiful thing. So, so why this myth? Or what, is it, what, is the, what is the vested interest in this myth of national division? What is it preying on, actually? I think it's preying on a deep psychic insecurity in our country. This is what I'd like to close this section with before I open this to Q&A, where I'd like to spend most of our time. I think what's going on actually is that we are suffering from perhaps the greatest loss of self-confidence in our country that we have encountered probably since the Civil War. And I'm not saying that as a matter of hyperbole. I think since about 1864, this is in 2024, the greatest crisis of national self-confidence in the United States of America that we see. Gen Z, less than 16% of Gen Z says they're proud to be an American. We have a 25% recruitment deficit in our own US military. This comes at a moment where we see a rise in depression, anxiety, a mental health epidemic spreading faster than COVID-19 in the United States of America. What's going on there actually? I think there's a deeper deficit. A lot of our national division, a lot of the rise of these secular trends from wokeism to transgender ideology to climate ideology to even frankly the covidism of policies of a few years ago i think these are all symptoms of a deeper void in our country a symptom of a void of purpose and meaning and identity at a time in our national history when the things that used to fill that void faith in god patriotism hard work family these things have disappeared. And when you have a black hole in your heart that runs that deep, that's when the poison fills the void. And sometimes we make this mistake. We, I say we may be in the conservative movement, I say we may, referring not to other people I'm blaming, but even myself, we make this mistake of focusing on the poison, playing the game of whack-a-mole. You got some wokeism over here, well, you know, don't worry, we got some anti-Semitism over here, we got that down, and climate ideology will slap that down. It's a losing game unless we actually fill that void with the real thing. There's an old expression from Blaise Pascal, who, like Adrian, like my parents, was also a famous scientist, in this case over 400 years ago, who famously said that if you have a hole the size of God in your heart and God does not fill it, something else will instead. In the civic sphere, you would say, if you don't pledge allegiance to the American flag, you're going to pledge allegiance to a different flag instead. It's wired in us 
There's something about us as human beings that we want to bend the knee to something bigger than ourselves. We're all hungry to be part of something bigger. Yet today we live in a moment where we can't even properly answer what it means to be an American. What does it mean to be an American in the year 2024? I think we lack a good answer to that question, but we need it. We don't need to reinvent it. I just think we need to revive the ideals that set the country into motion the first time around back in 1776. And if we do, if we fill that vacuum with the real thing, a real vision of our national identity, a real revival of faith in God, not a four letter word, I don't think it should be, revive grounding in the family that I'm the son of two parents, a mother and father who brought me into the world. That means something, that that is true, that is real, that I'm a citizen of this nation, the United States of America, not some nebulous global citizen fighting climate change somewhere, but a citizen of the greatest nation known to mankind. And that is a part of my identity, that I work hard, get ahead, riding not some tectonic plate of group identity based on my genetics, but that you are an agent endowed by your creator with your own unique skills that you can use to achieve the maximum of your God-given potential without anybody standing in your way. Revive that self-confidence that we lack. And I think our other problems melt away as a consequence. I think our economic problems mostly melt away, where the input to the success of an economy is actually self-confidence, to be able to take risks and create things that don't otherwise exist. The ability to be a nation that stands for the rule of law has to believe in its own legitimacy to enforce those laws. The threat to self-governance is a skepticism that we, the people, could self-govern, so we had to give it to Anthony Fauci's and three-letter bureaucrats' agencies to be able to do it instead. I think if we revive that missing self-confidence in our country, then our best days are actually still going to be ahead of us. Not in some you know, fake kumbaya, cheesy politician way, but in a true way, I actually believe that our best days as the United States of America can still be ahead of us. That we still are on our way to that shining city on a hill. That country where we will look our kids in the eye and mean it when we tell them. You get ahead in the United States of America with your own hard work, your own commitment, your own dedication, and that you know what? You are free to speak your mind at every step of the way. That is the American dream. That is what we are running to. And with your help, and with the confidence of the next generation behind us, that is how we will actually make America great again. So thank you all for the warm welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Welcome to introduce the topic and forward this up to Q&A before we wrap up.